if if you're on the Skype app, you can see the agenda. I blocked out an hour today for um, just to talk about steering committee and the Wetland Council. I'm hoping that uh, we don't actually spend a whole hour. We can do this pretty quick today. Sort of talk about my main goal, and this is to talk about the next steps for this year for the Wetland Council. Uh, which actually might mean that we talk for a whole hour, uh, because I know there's a lot of opinions. <clears throat> but what I first want to do, um, we'll just sort of go around and say who's who's out there on the call today, and then also who's in the room with me. So um, I'll start. It's Steve. It's hi. <laughs> um, I want everyone to just be aware. I'm trying something new to help me. Um, keep a record of these meetings that we're recording, um, both what's being presented and being talked about so that it's a record. Uh, that way I can go back and I can, uh, our admin may help transcribe it, but it also gives me a way if I have questions about what was said and ideas. I'm not relying on my notes, which are notoriously incomplete. Um, also, as part of it being sort of a record of these meetings, um, if you've noticed what we did with the last Wetland Council meeting where we posted the videos from the presentations, we can also put these audio files up of steering committee meetings uh, on the wiki page so that other people could access them and see, hey, what are we, what are we talking about? It's kind of this idea of transparency and accountability type of stuff. Um, all right, so I introduced myself. Um, Catherine. Hi everyone, Catherine Whiteman. I'm here in Helena with Steve. Okay, and I'll just start off. Uh, Mary. Mary Manning, Forcers. Abby. Oh, maybe we lost Abby's connection. No, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Abby Dresser, Ducks Unlimited. Uh, Andy. Andy Ray, National Park Service. Andrea. Andrea Silverman, Prickly Pear Land Trust. Alden. Alden Shellcross, Bureau of Land Management, State Office. Nikki. Nikki Sanvi, uh, DNRC. Uh, Amy. Amy Chadwick, Great West Engineering. And Rich. Rich McEldowney, Confluence Consulting. And I gotta say, it's a cold uh, day in Bozeman. Do you have snow? Yes. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> we had hail Happy last summer. night in my house, so we're not doing much better. Well, all I can say is I enjoyed the cold because I went for a bike ride this morning and I wasn't hot. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, all right. So everyone, thank you again for uh, attending the steering committee meetings. Um, it is my plan to have these on a more regular basis, meaning uh, regular meaning like a quarterly. I don't want to have too many, um, but as I will talk about. Um, Building on what we actually, it's been almost a year since we last met and talked about this. Um, building on what we kind of decided and talked about as a potential structure for the council and the steering committee. Um, to keep the council sort of viable and, and I talk about it in ways of providing the products to other members being the information from steering committee meetings, newsletters, um, I would like to get some of the trainings like plant ID trainings up and going again, but providing some of these products out to other members, I'm going to have to rely on help from steering committee members and other wetland council members because um, my role has changed. Actually, DEQ's role within the wetland council has changed 
from uh, Linda and Jordan being pretty much 100% of their time being able to work on what like council things to Jordan leaving and having 0% of someone's time on the council um, to my time now being at more of a 25% of my time that I can dedicate solely to well and council uh, activities. And um, if you're looking at at the screen and you have a picture, this is sort of what we had talked about in, I think it was May of 2018, where um, the steering committee uh, developing a steering committee that is really reflective of all the different wetland council members. Um, I have been trying to, currently we have 15 members on the steering committee. I think besides NRCS, um, we have someone from all the federal, uh, NRCS and, and Fish and Wildlife Service. We have all the federal agencies uh, that are land management agencies. Uh, we have everyone in state government minus maybe Department of Ag having a representative on the steering committee. Um, nonprofits, we have three nonprofits. Um, Andrea, now I asked Andrea as a land trust to um, join. So thank you, Andrea. And then we also have three different representatives from private industry um, consultants, Amy and Rich today, who are on the phone. And then Andrew, I, I kind of lumped you in as university, but also as um, federal government with National Park. Is there a preference where you'd like to be placed or not placed at all? <laughs> uh, probably National Park Service. Okay. All right, so that's so my role within DQ and the Wetland Council. Um, I've been given twenty five percent of my time, and how that really looks at is acting sort of as um, this point person who helps organize steering committee meetings, um, helping make sure things like the newsletter gets out. Wetland Council meetings are organized and put on um, any other kind of trainings as well that come up. But where where the council and those kind of products will suffer is, um, especially with Linda, she organized every single meeting, found the speakers, did the topics. And this is where um, in the survey I went out and asked who would be willing to help organize these kind of meetings and uh, we had eight different people or organizations say, hey, I would love to help like organize a meeting around a topic or something. And so um, I don't think all of them, maybe half of them were steering committee members, half were not. They're just sort of wetland council members. And so this is where the rules kind of change is that it's not going to be DEQ as much always driving hey, what's the next wetland council meeting and who are the speakers? It will be me helping provide logistics, but working with a partner or partners to put on different wetland council meetings of topics, but allowing them to more set the topic, um, get the speakers, sort of organize it in that way. Pretty much what the Heritage Program did for the March meeting, except um, they didn't really need any help from me. So... All I did was provide a room, but I would be able to support organizing those meetings a lot more. Um, but we will be relying on partners to help really get these kind of products out. Um, the other role that I, I do have and I just was talking about is developing the steering committee to be reflective of all members. And so you know, I did point out where we're missing a couple of the federal, we're missing tribal, and I've talked with uh, Larry Urban about different tribal contacts, but 
if steering committee members um, can sort of help provide names or um, introductions where we can maybe get some different steering committee members to really reach out and broaden who we are so that we're representative. Um, tribal is, I think most of the tribal contacts I knew are no longer uh, in their position. So that's, that's sort of a tough one for me. Steve, I can, um, I can reach out to Kyle Tack at an NRCS and can talk with him. Be interested. Great, that would be, and that was on my list to do. Thank you. So, um, kind of with that, I want to just kind of quickly open up. Does anyone have any ideas of who might or should be on a steering committee? Um, I guess the NGOs and university are um, are maybe where we're we're lacking a little bit, and the tribal. Uh, does anyone have suggestions about who might be good to sort of represent broadly represent those interests? Hey, Steve. This is Mary. Um, I just thought of Kelsey Jensko at U of M. He runs the Water Center or something like that. Um, do you want me to talk to him? He sure. might be a person of interest to include. Okay. And then what about any of the Clark Fork Coalition folks? You know, they came to the wetland delineation training, and I thought about them, too. I could talk to them. Um, they could they could be good. We also have MWCC, and I don't think Aaron was available today. That's sort of the over overarching for watershed groups. Um, okay, sure. Yeah, that's fine. But but UM Water Center. I was also um, trying to get hold of Water Course at MSU. Is that right, water course? Um, Steve, it's really water center, water course. Um, there's no other employees at water course. So water center with, um, so Whitney would be a good person to contact. Okay. All right. Um, so that's sort of the update on my role at DEQ. Uh, I have, just so everyone does know, I have funding for this year and next year, and I will continue to write into uh, DEQ's well and program development grants, money for time to support the council. And hey Steve, uh, this is Rich. Um, I just wanted to Mentioned, you know, for a tribal uh, representative, it seems as though the CSKT um, reservation has a pretty strong program, and they might might have a good wetland person to to be on our steering committee. Yes, and Larry gave me a name. Um, I'm sort of shuffling through my notes. Larry gave me a name the other day about who to talk to at CSKT. Okay, cool. Uh, any other comments on that before we move on? All right. Um, so the next topic, and it's, it's the only real topic what I wanted to discuss today is the next steps for the Welland Council and um, the steering committee. I'll, I'll start out first with sort of a broad um, picture for the Welland Council before really talking about us. 
So we do want to continue to put on um, at a minimum two wetland council, full wetland council meetings per year. Um, I don't know if we'll really be able to support three, but uh, we can definitely support two of them. DEQ will support one, will support and organize one wetland council meeting each year. And we would like, uh, and this is where we would like partners to help us organize at least one more during the course of the year on a variety of different topics. Um, really kind of thinking sort of a, the schedule that we've always had, a spring and a fall, um, and maybe dropping that mid-winter January meeting that we always had that everyone within 100 miles of Helena could never get here <laughs> because, because of the weather. And so two two full wetland council meetings. Um, and, and I do like the idea, um, keeping one in Helena, but I don't mind actually branching out to other places to try and, um, get members who, who aren't able to travel as much, uh, whether that be, uh, I don't even know if we could, if Billings, out as far as Billings, but Billings, Kalispell, Missoula, Bozeman, uh, ranching out so that we, we really do start including more and more people who aren't able to travel to Helena on sort of the basis to attend this meeting. And kind of how I feel about that one is um, the people who responded that they are able to help um, organize a meeting to do it more locally where they're based. Um, that way it's easier potentially for them. Um, the resources are more and, and it kind of, I don't know, I think it personalizes it a little bit more as well. Um, and I'd sort of like people's thoughts on that, having the ability to move council meetings around. I like the idea, having local hosts Personally, I think it's a great idea. This is Mary. I know when um, Linda hosted one once in Lewistown, and it was a really super well attended meeting. People standing. Yeah, that I kind remember of that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. She had done that, and I thought that was great. Yeah, I remember we had Lewistown, Kalispell, and a Missoula. Um, a Missoula meeting and they were all well attended and and often they were attended by different crowds. Um, Was there a, a field component with any of those? I'm just wondering if that's an opportunity if there's a example to go look at that's topical if that's something folks are interested in or not. Um, yes there are. I know in Lewistown we went out to Brewery Flats. Okay and talked about the restoration that was done there. Um, I know it has been done. It was done in Dillon before my time, um, where there was a council meeting in Dillon, and then the day before was like an all-day tour mm -hmm. out somewhere. Uh, but I guess it would be up to the local host, but I guess, uh, you know, I, I'd like to put that out there for consideration that when a you know, when there is something that is appropriate to the topic and the local host wants to support it, I bet they we bring in people to get out and, and see some of these projects on the ground. I think that would be a draw for some folks. And I, I totally agree with that. So also, uh, with future wetland council meetings, I did touch on that we had people willing to um, help support it. One of the things that also came out, I was, um, and I was hoping our newsletter would uh, be out last week, but it hasn't come out yet. I went through and I looked at, uh, I sent out a survey after the March wetland council meeting 
and a couple reminders to really try and get uh, people who weren't able to attend to figure out why. Uh, I standardized the survey so that we can send it out every time, pretty much collecting the same information to start tracking changes um, so we can be more effective. This is a theme you'll hear me talk about quite a bit with strategic framework as well. Um, but what we got, 55 people responded to the survey, which I thought was pretty good. Uh, half of them did not attend the wetland council meeting, which was important. Um, one of the questions we did ask the meeting was uh, presented as a webinar. If people wanted to log in, most people knew that it was available. So that was kind of a good sign. The message wasn't missed that, hey, if you can't make it to Helena, you can still listen to it. Um, for the most part, the five people who were on the webinar said it functioned really well. Um, no issues. So that's good. I didn't want to like start providing this kind of a service just to have it fall apart. Um, the other thing that I asked as part of that survey was future topics. And I don't think it'll surprise anyone. Um, restoration, monitoring, and um, well, restoration and monitoring were the two top things that people wanted to learn about. Uh, and a whole variety of, there's a lot of different topics within restoration and monitoring. Um, mitigation, uh, being outside of, aside from restoration, was also a very big topic. So didn't really learn anything new about, hey, what are the what are the things that everyone really wants to hear about and learn about? Um, one, and I don't think it should surprise any of us, one thing that did come out, uh, climate change and impacts to wetlands ranked just as high as restoration did. But I, I thought about this quite a bit and I don't know if in a meeting want to want to make climate the specific topic of the meeting and ignore it when we have other meetings. And so one of the things that I've been kicking around in an idea is that because this climate change and its impact on wetlands permeate throughout the topics we will be talking about, um, that in every meeting there should be some talk or focus on how climate change may impact whatever the topic is, whether it's uh, wildlife or habitat. Um, how do we monitor? A big question was how do we uh, look at monitoring impacts within mitigation projects? So that was one topic where I looked at it and said, hey, when we're doing wetland council meetings, um, there should be some presentation or focus at every single meeting on climate, uh, topically based. Which and Andy um, and others probably know researchers or people working on those topics much better than I do. So I will be reaching out quite a bit to, to really incorporate that in. Um, the other kind of big thing that I heard um, didn't really outline. We've talked about wildlife always centering around beaver in wetlands. And mm -hmm. a lot of people said diversify. <laughs> there are a lot more species out there than just beaver. Uh, and, and I agree. And so it's a future topic that I would like to um, bring in as well. And, and it's another one of those that somewhat similar with climate change, um, wildlife could be incorporated as a topic in a lot of um, restoration or mitigation or monitoring, whatever it is that is the focus of a wetland council meeting. Why do I feel like there's a full sign in my head? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
There is a bullseye on Catherine's head and Abby's and whoever else deals with wildlife. Um, I would love to say that there's a bullseye on my head for wildlife, but I don't get to deal with wildlife anymore. So one of the other things from the survey that came out, there's a sort of, um, I asked people to basically, hey, what do you want to hear from? I didn't put, I put set categories, but I also opened it up to other comments and we've got a lot of comments about what people want. And some of them were sort of, uh, I'm calling them one-off topics that I think are really interesting and would like to present on, but I don't know if you could build an actual wetland council meeting around, like a full day meeting. And so what I was thinking of doing, um, working with whoever really had the interest in that topic and providing, it could be something like a lunchtime webinar, wetland council webinar about for one hour about whatever that topic may be. Um, some of them that came up were um, unmanned aerial vehicles and their use in monitoring. Um, I, you could maybe develop a whole day around that topic, but I thought that was a pretty good, is there an example of what, of someone doing this for wetlands in the state? And could we get a presentation on it? Um, and Rich, this might have been something you would put forward, but a broad category of, okay, what are other innovative ideas in wetlands work? And, you know, I, I started thinking about, okay, I don't know if we've ever had a council meeting that has really talked about constructed wetlands. Um, constructed wetlands specifically for the purpose of like reducing pollution or sediment. Um, I can think of a couple examples, the Ennis fish hatchery, which has several cells of um, constructed wetlands to help. I don't even remember what they're, what they're reducing, what they're taking out of the water. Um, Rich, do you remember? Um. I'm sorry, Steve. You said uh, constructed wetlands and what what they're taking out of the water. Is that was was that the question? Yeah, like the Ennis fish hatchery. Um, what was their purpose for con doing constructed wetlands? Oh, you know, I'm not familiar with that facility, um, but I imagine it it has to do with nitrogen and phosphorus, mainly nitrogen. But anyways, sort of ideas like like that, one-off topics that we could do lunchtime webinar about um, that interest people. Is that something that you guys would support? I think that's a good idea. Yes, yes. we're all getting ourselves yes. in unit. We're not just delaying yes. because we think it's a bad idea. Yeah. We really want to be clear. You don't want to hear me watering my plants floating around. So, yes, excellent. No, I, I understand the the delay. I was glad. <laughs> I always worry with these that everyone's just checking their emails for like. No. Cruising the internet because there's just like, oh my gosh, there's a talking head out there. Sorry, in my space. I am fascinated by this discussion. I love it. Okay. Um. Steve, I was going to, um, I think that, you know, the one off topics, I like the webinar thing a lot. And then there may be some that um, it's really good material for kind of a feature in the wetland. Uh, newsletter. Um, so you could also uh, another option if somebody is really maybe it's not quite right for a webinar or somebody's just not up to that. Somebody could develop something that's kind of just a a featured educational thing in the in the newsletter. I think that's a great idea. 
Great. That's a good suggestion, Amy. Thank you. Hey, Steve. I don't know if I ever mentioned this, and maybe I'm just losing my mind, and Catherine, maybe you're somehow involved with this. You probably are. So help me if I'm losing my mind. I have been involved with these Association Wetland Manager webinars. Catherine, are you involved in that, or did I just get you confused? No, you're involved with the WIP. Tell me what. <laughs> There's so many things I'm involved with right now, I can't keep track of who's doing what. But does that sound familiar to anybody, or is it just me? We are the ASWM webinars? Yeah. I've been, and I thought I had brought this up to either you, Steve, or somebody. Did I? To anybody? Uh, you and I had talked about it, and I know. Um, we're oh, yeah, members. you and I talked about it. Yeah. We're because members of ASWM. Uh, Brenda Zolich, it's Brenda Zolich from the, um, the National Office, and then Jean, something or other. But these are all geared towards landowners, but the, the audience, the practitioning, uh, practitioner audience, if you will, are like the soil cons and range cons for NRCS. But um, they have some really great webinars that are tied to um, things like restoration and creation of wetlands. Um, I just thought I'd bring it up in case we want to see if there's anything we want to share from what they're doing. I'm actually, this is Amy, I'm actually involved in that um, steering committee. Uh, uh, but of course, the one I'm involved in is just the, this focus, or the series they're going to do about beaver stuff. Um, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I do agree that we actually need to branch out from beavers and <laughs> wildlife. Even I agree with that one. Um, but yeah, so I, but if there is something where um, we want to be tied in, um, they are very actively asking for suggestions for people to give webinars or yeah. ideas for webinars. They're, they're quite interested. So that's yeah. something where yeah. if we do want to tie in, um, for sure I could I help make that link. Yeah, and I know Steve, is it Jean Larson is the name right or am I getting it wrong? Who's the sort of the national Sorry. person? Uh, it was Jean Christie, and she's retired, and now it's um, Marla Steck, Stelk. Okay. Yes, I've been seeing emails from her. Well, I just bring it up, and and um, I guess I'd also like to make a comment about Beaver in the sense that I think my sense is we are really looking at them in terms of their role as a hydrologic modifier. It doesn't preclude other wildlife from being important, but I think it's the idea that maybe muskrats do something, I don't know. But it just feels like they're the ones who have the greatest impact in terms of how they modify those systems. So I just, you know, Amy for your, just, or for whoever else. So I'm all for other wildlife. Yeah. But I think the wildlife context then will be more who's the beneficiary of this excellent quality habitat, whether it's neotropical songbirds or small mammals or um, amphibians, whoever. And that can be discussed, absolutely. It's just a different um, way of portraying and discussing that particular animal, that's all. Okay, I'll mute myself again. <laughs> and so I'm going to put the bullseye square on that for a minute. Um, years ago, and this was literally years ago, she asked, as the beaver kind of topics were first coming out to really see about start looking at what is the effect when beavers come back into a system to other wildlife um, and birds and things and that's I know people probably monitor and look at some of this but I don't think it's recorded as much uh, what is the effect of restoration and mitigation on wildlife populations and what do we see coming back when and who leaves after a while? So we could we could certainly put together a whole wetland council meeting around this topic um, versus just having it be sort of wetland. I mean, we could also insert ourselves topically with wildlife, as you were suggesting, Steve. But I think, you know, hearing this conversation, it sounds like there's sort of a desire out there to have this larger conversation. And we could have a wetland council meeting just focused on wetland resources and wildlife and kind of run the gamut of, you know, restoration impacts, 
Um, we constructed what constructed wetlands and their role that they play for in certain landscapes for um, you know prairie nesting ducks and things. Um, and then we can talk about amphibians. You know, we could we can get some speakers and um, I think put together uh, a, hopefully a pretty good meeting. Um, and I. Um, would suggest that it, it not be beaver focused and the effects of beaver per se. I mean, if that is one of the appropriate presentations, that'd be fine. But I think we do need to have a bigger conversation. Yeah. Yep. So, and for yeah, folks, I agree with all that. Awesome. Good. And, and some of you may be aware um, FWP is working with uh, National Wildlife Federation and potentially some of you all on the phone. Um, I'm not on point for this, but I, I know it's happening um, to have a, a conversation with partners around beavers um, later this summer. So if that's not on your radar and you want it to be, um, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with Quentin who's heading that up for FWP. September or something. August 27th. I think. Oh, August 20, oh, 28th. 28th. Yes. Something like that. August 28th, because I know, because I'm going to be, it's my first day back in the office after like six weeks. Oh, so, excellent. Um, yes. Yeah. So, and, and it really is, at least my understanding is it's, it's, um, it's an effort to, to bring folks together and have a conversation around it. So, um, that's, okay. So that's what I hope it is. That's what I hope it becomes. Um, yeah. So let me know if folks are interested and don't have that information. Yeah, Catherine, this is Mary. I, I am interested and I will um, just send you an email. I think one of the big issues that I've dealt with over the years is trying to get the buy-in from the fish bios, you know, in terms of are, they, are those series of dams creating some sort of a um, barrier. And I, from the big hole to the Upper Ruby, and as it varies, but I think as a land management agency, I am curious, and Alden might be too, just from the point of view of the fish folks. Um, so, because we know they benefit amphibians. I mean, Bryce has shown that, I believe, and then there's been other work too that has certainly demonstrated that. Brett Roper gave a great presentation uh, at the SWS SCR meeting in Spokane showing what happened when in around Logan, Utah, when they um, stopped trapping and the beneficiaries of that, you know, beaver recolonization and expansion. So, um, yeah, I would just say I'm interested. So, thanks for letting us know about that. Excellent. And um, we do have fisheries staff um, within Fish, Wildlife, and Parks that are engaged in, in putting Excellent. this together. So hopefully that will be well represented. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to switch topics um, because actually the last topic is what I really want to touch on most. Um, and Steven, Steve, sorry, Nikki yeah. here. Um, back to the just briefly on on some of the webinar stuff is uh, if you were doing some sort of feedback from a council meeting, maybe check what day of the week, you know, in general, what day of the week and what time of the day works best for webinars. Sometimes when I think when we try to slam those in at lunch, there's not as much potentially attendance or pay attention. That's my thought. So if you're already putting out something like, for, uh, you know, an evaluation, use that as an additional question. Okay. For Thank you. Yep. I will add that to that survey that I'm just going to copy and modify. Um, okay, so right at the end of the last Wetland Council meeting that the Heritage put on, um, developed this Wetland Council PV Works page. Uh, this, this page is something that's administered by DEQ, by me but it's outside of state servers. So we're not limited. Uh, we've never really had a wetland council page that wasn't under DEQ um, and under state control about what we could and how things could look. So I've developed a, a PV works page that's basic. <laughs> Let me stress, it's basic. 
that I want to use essentially for four different things. One of them is just it's an introduction to the Wetland Council, uh, who we are, what we do, links to what is right now the old strategic framework, as well as a way if you're interested to sign up for the council. Um, for us, what's important, this is also where we can post a lot of information. So for like the last meeting, uh, and this is what I'm going to do for every single meeting, going to post all of the materials and the recorded presentations in links so that we have a record. Uh, and I don't know how far we want to go back, but we'll have a record of each meeting that's happened, as well as agenda presentations and attendee list. Uh, if there's notes or other materials, they will also get attached so that this page will always be able to be a reference people can go back to. Um, it will also have information about whatever the next meeting coming up is. Um, right now, I'm the only one who can add information, but because this is a shared workspace, we can give access to anyone uh, and I would probably limit it to the steering committee members, but people who want to be able to post information or help post stuff, I can give access to anyone to be able to work within this structure. Uh, and where that gets important is I've developed a wetland steering count committee page that has nothing on it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but this is where like, I will post the recording from this meeting, um, any notes that I transcribe or other kind of information, the agenda from today's meeting. Uh, I will post all of that so it's available to people. And similar to the Wetland Council meetings, I will also post the um, most current and next ag meeting agenda. Um, so the final thing with this, newsletters will also be available. Um, those are the past ones we have. Uh, Heritage Program is currently working on the spring 2019, so that new one will be posted there as well. So this is basically a way just to always have a record of what we're doing, or who we are, what we're doing, and um, sort of a repository. We can add pages, we can add different files, um, we can put comments if we want, uh, but this is I, I plan to sort of go more to using this for uh, well and council information. Um, always linking to this page where I can. So um, I sent out a link to this in the email with the agenda. Um, I'll just let everyone on their own time sort of check it out because I want to get to the next step. So. The last thing and the most, uh, to me, sort of the most important is the strategic framework. Um, we're currently, since the Wetland Council has started, there has been three iterations, uh, I think starting in 1997. There have been three iterations of some kind of plan for the Wetland Council. Um, the most recent one we have ended in 2017, and I would like to start talking about updating this document. But when I'm thinking of updating the strategic framework, I'm kind of looking at a wholesale reconstruction of what this document is. Um, aside from the introductory material, which is good, who we are, sort of the goals, guiding principles, whatever, um, mission statements, I don't necessarily want to um, think about revising some of that because I always feel like if you're going into revising the mission statements because you don't really have a vision of what to do next, <laughs> like I'll start there and then we'll, we'll build on. What I really want to, to change is how we're looking at our strategic directions 
Um, and I'm going to scroll through quickly just to one of them as an example. These, they're good and they're a record of what people have been doing in, uh, in the wetlands arena in Montana. But they're very focused and were written based on what individual people or groups were doing um, to help support their work. Um, and I don't want to, my work is in there too, so don't get me wrong, I'm kind of bashing on myself with this, but a lot of it was written specifically so that people could justify the work that they're doing um, to help us accomplish the goal. And I would kind of like to flip the script when we think about that and, and look more at um, what are the, not the actions that are being taken, but what are some of the actions that we can take to accomplish what currently our state well and goal is of no net loss. Um, but what actions can we take as council members or professionals working in the field that somehow touch wetlands so that we can start moving the state forward and actually being able to quantify some of that. Like currently at the moment, we have this huge overarching goal. Um, but besides being able to say we did a project here and a project there, we don't really have any way to really track how effective have we been towards progressing to our goal. And I would like the strategic framework to be more of a document that outlines a plan that we can, we can kind of put measures on to help us understand what are we doing and where are we doing it? Um, is that kind of what I told you on the phone? I feel like it just got off track. No, I think that I already have two thoughts. Do you want me to share them or do you want me to let you finish? Um, let me, just one second. Yeah, was, was that clear to everyone? Because I feel that was really disjointed. Yeah. One person can give me a yes or no besides Catherine. Yeah, it was yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was clear. All right. Go, go ahead, Catherine. Just, just listening to you talk, Steve, I, I had two thoughts. Um, one is you're making me think of some of the planning that the bird habitat joint ventures have recently gone through to develop their strategic plans and their they do some um, spatial modeling and also some strategic targeting based on resource values um, and then brought in what are what are people's real expectations of what they can get done so it's a bit of a blend of not just yeah. i don't want anything right now okay hi avery <laughs> sorry guys i've got avery just came in here on my lap and i thought i was i didn't unmute my phone that's okay it sounds awesome <laughs> um but it, it's sort of a blend between putting out the big picture, but then as this document did, calling up what are people doing, what are the realistic expectations that partners are going to be able to do in the next five years to meet those goals. So I, I kind of like that way of thinking, but the other thought related to that was that was a heck of a lot of work to pull together that level of strategic planning. And do we collectively, or you individually, Steve, have the time and resources to do that? Okay, so to address specifically that, um, your strategic planner from the JB meeting, uh -huh. I'm hiring Rachel, Rachel to, to help us go through this process. And I'm, I'm currently, like, today working on the purchase order for her to start by... Um, interviewing and working with the steering committee to collect, we're calling it the collect data phase, basically collect data about um, our priorities, projects, uh, vision moving forward to basically get a good understanding of where do we all stand at the moment and what do we see that is this, this big picture and realistic. So um, 
fifth, is it, I don't want to say fifth element, but that's not right. Fifth house, fifth element was a movie. Um, <laughs> fifth house, uh, we're hiring them basically to help do all of this data collection, compile it, and provide a report out so that come August or early September when I come back, uh, I can work on, it's my job, my capacity will be to help develop the draft. Kind of like what Linda did, all this information was compiled. Linda wrote up a draft strategic framework, presented it out to the larger committee. Um, I'm hoping to use Fifth House to essentially collect all that data that Linda and I did in this last one, compile it for us so I can write a draft. And then they're also going to help us put together a day and a half um, or a day. We'll see how much what people can set aside sometime in October, November, a day, day and a half meeting to sit down and go over the strategic framework that was developed based on the draft. And my, so I think I sort of gotten ahead of myself, but my plan has been with updating the strategic framework is that, uh, and why it's really important for me to have a representat representative group of the Wetland Council is that the first draft and hopefully a fairly complete draft will largely be based off of um, information and data collected from steering committee members. And then once the steering committee information is uh, collected, put together and written up into a draft document to then take it out to the actual wetland council. Um, I think we will obviously query wetland council people uh, maybe targeted as well uh, to get it broader where we feel we need broader uh, information, but not really involve the full wetland council until we have something a little bit more concrete um, and then have an actual planning meeting. And, and it is my goal by the end of this year to have uh, a new strategic framework, uh, six months. And I don't know if that's unrealistic or not, but at least to have something that is a really good draft that uh, we can take to, like we've always done, we can take to the heads of the natural resource agencies in the state to sign off and, and give something to the governor, hopefully to sign off on as well. Um, coupled with that, and maybe this is just personal and I would also like people's opinion on this, to not go for strategic framework, but actually push to see if we can get a call a wetland plant, state wetland plant. Um, something that, and I think Alden, you, you got me thinking about this a long time ago when you said, I use that document or I can use a plan to take to my management to show the actions that we're doing or we want to do is actually something Andy that we want to do. Who is that? Um, yeah, and, and I know it's 11 and people have to go. But any, any comments on sort of this approach to moving forward with updating the strategic framework? I like that approach and I think having a, a state wetland plan is great because having kind of the, the water plan through DNRC has been so useful and um, I, um, I wonder, are there any limitations, like if it were called the wetland plan, is there any, does that raise any barriers or obstacles? I mean, is, is there anything else we would have to navigate around if that were the case? Is there a reason it's already strategic framework, I guess? 
instead. I have heard some administrator types um, make differentiate between plan and say a strategy and that a plan commits resources while a strategy just sort of lays a path forward. So I, I and I've just heard that from some people, but that's just one thing we could think about that we might have to navigate by changing into a plan. Yeah, that sounds familiar. I think that's what was kind of tickling in the back of my mind there when I raised that question. Because I, I do believe there's, there is something like that. There was some reason we couldn't do something else as a plan in the past. Yeah, I know probably most state agencies will be happy to sign off on something that says we're going to we're going to work towards these good things in the future they're going to be much more reluctant to sign off saying yes we are going to commit resources to doing x y and z five years from now so that may have something to do with the terminology but we can we can continue to weigh pros and cons mm -hmm. and, and that just might be I mean, would it be any less useful sorry Steve, go ahead um, yes and no. It, maybe, maybe I do actually want to see, and this comes from within my own as well, a commitment by those of us who deal with these resources to actually commit. Um, it's really easy to say, yes, that's great. Go for it. We'll do something without committing anything. And, uh, but I don't know, I mean, that's something that maybe have to talk, start talking to, imagine especially those who would be signing off is right off the bat before going down this road, is it even viable to, to ask for that commitment? Or do we want to just keep it as a guide for moving forward in the state and building the case for commitment? If we called it a strategy, but then had a section within it that talked about agencies involvement and you know see what we could get them to basically commit to in the strategy, would that maybe navigate in between those concerns? And yeah, it's just an idea. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's a good thought. I was also wondering if there was a way to write it up as a plan and put in some commitments, but kind of have enough waffle words around those commitments that uh, management was was comfortable that they still had the flexibility to make yearly funding decisions and allocations. One of those, something, but That's some combination that too. might work. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just writing notes. This is Mary. I would say in terms of the Forest Service, no commitment of financial resources. However, what that does is when there's year-end funds, I can, and I think maybe that's what Alden was getting at too, um, we can mm -hmm. look to that as a document that guides how we can spend, spend fun. funds. And yeah. I think that's what we need in the Forest Service. I can't commit any resources, but we can if we have extra money. So that's what works for us. Mary, would that would that change based on what the document's called? That I can't any... answer. I <laughs> okay. I think I defer to Catherine because she worked on the sage grass conservation strategy. Um, you know, you guys that and we have new grants and agreements people, I'd have to check with them. Things are changing within our our agency, um, but it's always the mantra is no commitment of financial resources. We're happy to sign on the dotted line. We'll make our pe people available to you. But again, that doesn't preclude us from providing funds for particular projects that meet the intent. And that was always Linda Saul's thing, right, Steve? You know, there was the EPA wetland grant program and, and breaking it into watersheds in the, I think it was the second 
strategy document um, and really prioritizing action plans to meet the intent and in looking at those grant proposals that addressed certain aspects of that strategy document. Um, so either way, it's great that we have something structured. I think agencies, entities are much more willing to fund something that has some outcomes, tangible outcomes, and a kind of a game plan. So either way is fine. Yep. And, and that's that kind of gets to the meat of what I would like to see with this document is that it, we start to be able to see tangible outcomes, um, and they don't have to be measured by numbers, but it's things that we can actually point to as helping to move us forward um, and tracking that. So I'm going to cut it off there so we don't go more than 10 minutes over. Um, the next steps with this, you will be hearing from me. Um, I'm going to work with Fifth House on uh, basically what kind of data do we need? Who needs? Who should we talk to um, about within the steering committee about the strategic framework and moving forward? So I'm leaving July 15th for Europe, and I would like to have a brief meeting before that to introduce Rachel and sort of the next steps that she'll be working on uh, while I'm gone. Although I won't be totally gone because I have to work as well while I'm gone. <laughs> but um, don't have enough vacation. I skied too much this year. It's my own fault. Um, <coughs> anyways. So you're gone a long time. You're going all over Europe, or this is exciting. You're, um, no. Are you doing something specific, or...? We're going to Poland to see my wife's family, and so we'll spend oh. all six weeks in in Poland. Most of it, uh, most of it, where she grew up. Wow, that's great. That sounds really nice. Yeah, it'll you. be nice. <laughs> oh. You laugh. I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope it's good for you. It, it's. I like my in-laws, but it's six weeks of in-laws. Staying at their house. Well, I wasn't going to say that, but hey, you might really love them, and anyway, they're there, and you'll come back here, and life is good. Yeah. Okay. Um, any any final comments? Hey, Steve. Uh, this is Rich. I just wanted to um, comment on the, the, the is now plan exiting. for uh, the plan for the strategic framework. Um, I feel like. It, it really needs to be called a plan. I really would like to see it called a plan. The strategic framework seems a really, really just kind of, I don't know, I uh, don't really know what to do with it. Um, it's not, I guess the, the last one that we did uh, has a lot of great information in it. I think it's overly complex. Um, but in general, your plan uh, is, is a good one. I think that the only thing I'd add to that is that we need to also be thinking of how we can uh, roll it out, and that needs to be part of the kind of the whole thought process, um, so that we can basically um, sell it to the people that are going to be implementing it, and make make them really make everyone uh, really embrace it and and implement it because I, I'm, I guess this last strategic framework, um, I don't really know any of the outcomes and that's really your point. Um, but I, I have a, my sense is that uh, a lot of things weren't accomplished in that. And I would like to have a plan where we can actually have some good accomplishments that we can point back to. Um, so anyway, just a few thoughts on from my end. Great, thank you, Rich. All right, uh, everyone, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to write up the notes, and they will be posted on that uh, PB Works page as well as this audio. Uh, I will have to go back and listen to this audio as well, but. I will also set up 
uh, a meeting within the next three weeks, trying to keep it as brief as possible. Again, I'm sorry for running over today, uh, trying to get better about that. But I realized, uh, which is good, we have a very vocal group. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I don't think you should feel sorry about it. If we were all quiet, I'd be worried. Maybe we can do, I don't know, can we do an hour and a half, or is that asking too much? Because I think we have really good discussions. I really think it's time well spent, because we're all kind of reconnecting and getting our energy back into this. So personally, it's worth my time, just an okay. FYI. I can, and I can, I can extend the meeting out longer, uh, and then if we run short of topics, we can always end it early. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. Again, thank you so much, everyone, and um, I will put this stuff out to you as <coughs>